Hey, what's up? This is Seth Green, and you are listening to Somewhere in Vegas with Mark, and I am so hot, I would desperately like a glass of water. Please, please, give me some water. This is Cindy Preston, and I'm with Mark on Somewhere in Vegas. Hi, this is Melissa Peterman from CMT's The Singing Bee and the television show Reba. And I have to tell you, I just have to get it off my chest, I love Somewhere in Vegas with Mark. Hi there. This is Faith Roscoe from General Hospital. You're listening to Mark on Somewhere in Vegas. And you better watch out. We know how to find you if you're not listening. Hi, this is Shannon Egan from Whippet. And I love Somewhere in Vegas with Mark. Hey, this is Lee Allen Baker with Somewhere in Vegas. Talking with Mark with a Q. This is Courtney Cronin. You're listening to Somewhere in Vegas with your host, Mark. And I would make sure to listen every week because he's a sure bet. Hey, this is the money man. Any money, I got two tickets to paradise in this. You know what? It's somewhere in Vegas. And what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Hi, this is Crystal Kale, and I love Somewhere in Vegas with Mark. Hi, this is Terry Nunn from Berlin, and you're listening to Mark Somewhere in Vegas. Hi, this is Miracle Lori from Joss Whedon's Dollhouse. There are three flowers in a vase, and I'm listening to Somewhere in Vegas with Mark. Hi, this is Erin Hill, and you are listening to Mark on Blog Talk Radio and Somewhere in Vegas. Mark is a great guy. Hi, this is Sean Pulaski. I'm still trying to figure out Mark Pico's sexuality, but I know you're listening to Somewhere Live in Vegas. Here you go, Mark. I, I'm sorry. I thought you were he, she. I'm sorry. I, 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 get out of the tent. Let's get out of here. Hey, this is Lance and Anna from Free Radio and... Anna? And you're listening to Somewhere in Vegas. Yes. My favorite. favorite. My fa- you know, that's, that's usually what happens with me. I go to Vegas and I get lost, and so I end up somewhere in Vegas. Somewhere in Vegas. But okay. I just don't know where it is. Not quite sure. Yeah, word. Get ready. It's going to be hot. It's in Vegas. Check out Mark. Be there or be square. My guest at this time is a, uh, he has worked with some of the, the greatest acts on this planet and has uh, really turned that into a really great filmmaking career. His current, uh, his current, his current movie right now is a documentary on the legendary Chuck Berry. It's the first full length documentary we've seen about the life and times of Chuck Berry. John Brewer is on with us right now. How are you doing, John? Hi, I'm fantastic. A little bit rainy and cold over in England here, but uh, I'm I'm doing well. Yeah, it's starting to cool down here in Vegas right now too. I mean, it's it's starting to become uh, come fall really, so it's becoming really nice right down here as well. Um, you know, it's it's unbelievable to to kind of read a little bit about the resume and the career that you've had in terms of rock and roll and how you've been. Uh, you know, doing these great documentaries as of late. You did a really great documentary about B.B. King that has gained, garnered so a lot of critical attention as well. Um, tell me how how the um, how you got in from doing uh, you know rock and roll and becoming a manager to going into doing these great documentaries. Well, <clears throat> it's 50, uh, 50 years today from the time I first started. <laughs> So it's a long, long road that I've taken. But I started off in management and I was very involved with the beginning of David Bowie's career and made Hunky Dory with him and then I uh, managed a few bands, one of which was Yes, um, you know, and I went on to manage Alvin Lee and various other people in the rock field. And um, really, basically, on the business side and on the road side. But it wasn't like today, where it, it was a crazy time. We were setting parameters. We were setting boundaries which weren't there. And now what's happened is that, that that has changed. And when it started to change, I didn't really find it fun. So what I wanted to do was to go make a film and um, I started, I was actually one of the third largest distributors in the UK um, when the DVD, well not DVD, it was video then, but booms happened. And then went on to DVD, et cetera, et cetera. But I went back, I couldn't, you can't really get out of the music business. You're stuck to it. So I had publishing interests, you know, especially with Jerry Raffis, Rafferty's Baker Street, and various other th- records that I'd made with artists. And, 
I, I was stuck there, but I started making films, and then I decided that I wanted to. With I was going, I was talking to the BBC one day, and I just said, "Look, you know, I think we should do documentaries. These guys are getting older, and there's nothing recorded to really show what they really did do." And so that's when I started, and um, I've made, I think it's 20, 20 now. So quite a, quite a good little resume there, and um, got to do better and better. And now we're trying to put more storylines together uh, on musicians, and rather than the, you know, the, the, the uh, talking heads, dropped a lot of talking heads and just get a lot of audio involved and a lot of performance involved of archive performance and bb king was really it took me two years to get him to trust me and it took me two years to make it so yeah you know i mean yeah you're, you're speaking about bowie i mean bowie came at a, at a point at which um really the music um and the um the visual image was starting to uh mix a lot more um, he was really experimenting with um, his stylized, you know, his stylized with Iggy Stardust and all that as well. And so you were right there at the time where kind of were music and then it was transforming over to what would be, you know, eventually the music video. Um, and then a lot of these, a lot of these, you know, you know, visuals were used on stage and all that as well. Can you tell me a little bit about, you know just kind of observing that that point in history where we were seeing more more um you know more airplay of um musicians maybe live or you know, via, through music video and how that has uh kind of you know helped you translate into going into into film well you got um it it, it sort of mingles together somewhat i mean you know you've got very prolific artists that basically felt they had to have some sort of fashion that people related to them. And Bowie was a fantastic, I mean, fantastic sort of pioneer in wearing high platform shoes and boots before you ever saw them on the high street. And, um, the, you know, he, he, he found a pair of shoes and boots, platform boots in Japan, in Tokyo, and the next thing, he, he's wearing them on stage and the, and the year later, they're in the, the shoe shops all down the high streets and the malls and wherever. And he, he created fashion to a certain degree. He, he loved colours and he loved obscure uh, designs, uh, and much up to his, the, the, his dying days. And that influences us filmmakers, and that's what I am as a filmmaker, because you take that and you basically mold it into a style. Now, if you go to the, um, which you will be able to very shortly, go to the um, DVD of Chuck Berry, um, the documentary, or you can go and uh, stream it down or whatever you want to do, you will see uh, by the opening and all the way through with the uh, what we call the cutaways, you will see the color and designs that were created from. Um, hello. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Which were which were created by. Um, I'm, I'm getting coming in and out now. I'm not quite sure what's going on here. I can still hear you. Uh, there you oh, go. Yeah, I'm, I'm back on. So uh, the colors and, and, and the music bl blended in, you get the feeling, wow, this is Chuck Berry, because it's bright colors, rock and roll colors. It's the 50s, 60s mingled in together, and that's what he represented. So you may never think fit into that. The sound's really important, too. Um, and we emphasize a piece of his guitar playing or whatever it is that you suddenly recognize is his and can only be his. And it, it mixes and fl flows through into, um, you know, the way you think about the artist. And when you come away, you go, hey, that was rock and roll. That's what rock and roll was all about. You know, the colors of the jukebox, as I call them. Yeah, you know, I mean, 
you know, I'm just seeing some of the documentaries that are coming out now. They are really, um, they're really using the editing technology and the animation technology now to really kind of highlight some of the stories, which makes it makes it a little bit more exciting for the watcher. And um, you know, so many, so many, uh, so many people are, are now digging documentaries and these real life stories as well. So it's great to be able to see that utilized as well. And I'm pretty sure you've seen, you've seen the kind of the uh, the evolution from. The um, the old school film platform to what is now digital editing. So it's you know it's obviously something that's a lot lot easier and a lot better for you to kind of work out and kind of pump something out a little quicker. Yeah, it sure is. It takes long enough as it is today. Let alone when we went back to and, and sound is so important. Sound is the reason that live videos of DVDs of bands performing never was very big it was never that successful because when the dvd came in what happened was you could actually hear properly with um uh you know because the tech technical sound was there and you it was digital and you could therefore basically somehow push that out through the speakers or through the screen and it made people feel that the music was driving it. Whereas just recording concerts and things, it really, who wants to go and see a concert on the screen? I and mean, I can't. I mean, I like to feel that music pumping through my veins. And, you know, when we were on the film set and we shot this film in, not in, some in St. Louis, where he came from, but we were down in the desert, in the California desert. And at night, it was extremely cold. And we shot at night and we had two bins, big bins, speaker bins in the lot. And uh, I just pumped out Maybelline and everyone was dancing. You cannot not dance to that that record. And what it did was get over the feel of what he, of, of, of Chuck Berry. I mean, as simple as that. And they kept warm, <laughs> which was... Um, quite surprising but I mean you know that's what we've tried to do we 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 tried to choreographize the 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 uh, the uh, people that assisted us the actors that assisted us on the cutaways to synchronize the sound and movement and just get a bit like baby driver and the colors also synchronized into the sound so yeah it, it's very much better today to be able to work with these new techniques. Now, you know, I mean, you got some some really high end people to to um, to do this documentary, especially considering how influential Chuck was in the early days of rock and roll. Um, you know, what was it like to hear some of the stories that some of these artists artists have have, have told you about Chuck? And did you learn anything any anything interesting about Chuck uh, during the during the process? It's a really good question because the thing is, uh, I did learn something, uh, many things actually. Um, rock, uh, 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 Chuck was not, uh, I, I find it difficult to say because I'm not 100% sure, but you know, he lived a long time. And in the time when he started, um, there was. Um, a tremendous race problem and probably the people that were in the race problem didn't realize there was such a problem because it was so far out and his um the the the, the areas that he had to the, the hoops he had to jump through were quite absurd but it started really by basically being he was there's no question about it quite outrageous very bright very bright um, but he started probably on, on the wrong side of the road as as a young person. And that's what caused him to get into trouble. And as you probably know, he was at a reform school. And when he came out of the reform school, um, he was slightly different. Anyway, he was a poet and his poetry will stand up to anyone's poetry they would like to refer to. It was a, a poetry that related to to people, kids. He, he invented the teenager. And 
the word the teenager and the method and the way they went around as teenagers 